Tammy Lynn Leppert was an 18-year-old from Rockledge, Florida. She was an aspiring actress and had a small part in Scarface, starring Al Pacino. On July 6, 1983, Tammy called her friend Keith to come pick her up at home because she needed someone to talk to. Later, Keith dropped her off in Cocoa Beach after they had an argument. Tammy was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. like a good diversion. All of us have fallen victim to needing to get work done, and before we know it, we're posting GIFs or GIFs on our Facebook page, we're playing Candy Crush or Solitaire on our phone, or we're trying to learn the finer points of why people still listen to Nickelback. Sometimes it's tough to keep our mind on the important task at hand. In disappearances, and probably all unsolved true crime cases, it's very much the same thing. We so easily get caught up in diversions. They're most commonly called rabbit holes, the term coming from Alice in Wonderland. These diversions can be interesting and fun, but I'm not sure any of them have led to a case being solved. And that's the danger of them. It feels like something constructive is being done, when really, in the end, we don't have much to show for our efforts. In the disappearance of Tammy Lynn Leppert, the word diversion comes up quite a bit in my mind. In the film Scarface, Tammy's character becomes a dangerous diversion for Manny Ribera. With him being so caught up in her beauty, he almost fails to provide adequate backup for Tony Montana. But in real life, in Tammy's case, I'm wondering if all the diversions brought about by the police, Tammy's mother, and yes, possibly even Tammy herself before she vanished, have kept this disappearance from being solved. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. Tammy left her family's home in Rockledge, Florida in the late morning or early afternoon of July 6, 1983 with her friend Keith Roberts. He had driven two hours from Lakeland, Florida after Tammy called him in a distressed state. This call was the culmination of several months in which Tammy had exhibited bizarre and paranoid behavior, even to the point of sleeping with a knife under her bed. Months before, her short appearance in Scarface as the girl in the blue bikini seemed to quicken her growing mental instability. Keith claimed that after a couple hours of talking on July 6th, he and Tammy got into an argument. She wanted out of his car, so he dropped her off near the Glass Bank, a prominent Cocoa Beach landmark that has since been demolished. This is the last time anyone saw Tammy Lynn Leppert. There were no further sightings of her in the beach area or anywhere else. Keith Roberts was investigated, but the police could not find any proof he harmed Tammy, although Keith did refuse to take a polygraph test. To this day, police insist Keith Roberts is not a viable suspect in the case. About two years after Tammy's disappearance, the detective on the case received an anonymous call from a woman stating that Tammy had run away and was living a new life, pursuing her dream of becoming a nurse. To the detective, this seemed plausible due to Tammy having a contentious relationship with her mother, Linda Curtis, who was also Tammy's talent manager and agent. Not to mention that Tammy had expressed to many people that she desired to move to California and leave her mother behind. Over the years, different theories regarding Tammy's disappearance have been explored, including Tammy was murdered by serial killer Christopher Wilder or rapist John Brennan Crutchley, also known as the Vampire Rapist. Tammy's own mother floated the idea that Tammy was murdered due to Tammy finding out about a large-scale drug smuggling and money laundering operation out of Miami. However, all of these theories have led nowhere. Authorities are still unsure whether Tammy was murdered, was kidnapped, or left on her own. Her case remains unsolved. The interview for this episode is with true crime blogger Anthony Wayne, who runs crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com and has worked with the Leopard family on Tammy's case. Unfound news. 
I need to give a shout out to two Irish women in the Unfound Podcast discussion group, Lynn and Sinead. They've recently kept the rest of us apprised of a disappearance that has gripped Ireland and specifically Dublin since the early 2000s. The disappearance of Trevor Dealey has been that country's Mara Murray case, and it looks like Trevor's disappearance is on the verge of being solved, if it hasn't already by the time you are hearing this. I urge you all to check out the case for yourself. Thank you, Lynn and Sinead. We're slowly inching toward the completion of the website, the first volume of the Unfound book, and a few other new things for the program. Everything is still on schedule. Somebody in the discussion group asked me if at least one of the books would be finished by Christmas. The answer is a definite yes. In fact, I hope to have volumes one and two, if not three, completed by then. Finally, I continue to be pleased with the statistical direction of Unfound. The program continues to make steady progress with downloads increasing week after week, with the most recent shows continuing to break weekly records. I thank all the listeners and guests who are spreading the unfound word. Where you can find Unfound. On Facebook, the previously mentioned Unfound podcast discussion group, we now have over 1,300 members. On Twitter, at Unfound Podcast. On Instagram, at Unfound Podcast. On YouTube, the Unfound Podcast channel. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. You can subscribe at Podomatic, iTunes, and Stitcher. You can also find Unfound on TuneIn Radio. And please mention Unfound at Web Sleuth, Reddit, podcasts we listen to, and all other true crime websites and forums. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound Anthony Wayne. He is the writer, blogger, and owner of Crime Blogger 1983.blogspot.com. Anthony, welcome to Unfound. Thanks, Ed. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. Anthony, I'm really impressed with the coverage that you've given the Tammy Leopard case over the past months, if not years. I know you've gotten deep into it. We'll get into that in a second. First of all, tell the listeners. A little bit about yourself and how you got into true crime. I'm I'm a 33 year old. I'm, I'm native of Dallas, Texas, and I've been fascinated with um, disappearances mostly for the past five years or so. Um, I occasionally branch out into other crimes on the blog. If if like a family member contacts me, um, I'll go into something else. I do crime. I do all kinds of crime. Mostly it's disappearances. Um, before that, I, I I blogged a little bit. When I was heavily into like the politics and paranormal subjects, and I kind of got um, kind of bored with those, I kind of fizzled out my interests um, and, and disappearances. I don't think that'll ever fizzle out. Um, the other two subjects I was involved with kind of kind of like the same almost. People have made up their mind on each side, and um, it's not um, something that interests me. I'll occasionally go back into it every now and then, but it's not something I like to do. Uh, disappearances are, are pretty much fascinating to me. So, Do you think that goes along with your personality? You're kind of into mysteries and puzzles and things like that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure the listeners know uh, the, um, some of the shows on during the 90s when I was growing up, like Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack and before that In Search of Leonard Nimoy. I, I love that kind of thing. It's something I, I read about all the time. So, yeah, definitely fascinates me. And how long have you been – the blog is, though, relatively new from my understanding, but this is an interest you've had for a long time. Yeah, I'm, I'll be blogging for almost a year. I think next month is a year. I don't I don't remember. I think that is, but um, I've had interest for a long time. I've got <laughs> – my wife thinks I'm crazy. I've got notebooks about cases. I've written down all these notes, and um, I she gave me an idea one day about just you know putting it all together, organize it, and making a blog out of it because she sees how interested I am. I'll, I used to watch Disappeared an awful lot, or I'll go online and watch a documentary about a missing person. So yeah, it's something I've had, like I said, for the last five five or so years. How do you pick your cases out? And then I want to ask you specifically because that's what this episode is about: the disappearance of Tammy Leppert. How you specifically got into Tammy's case, but how do you, in general? Select your cases. I either choose a case that didn't have a lot of work done on it, 
or like a family member will contact me or I'll be fascinated with a certain case or cases. And I think the work that's done like online or something that's missed maybe an aspect or aspects and I'll decide to throw my two cents in. There's a couple cases where I've read that uh, they may have some good coverage to them, like um, Kelsey Jean Schilling, for, for example. Um, I'll, I'll watch the story and I'll just get mad about it and I'll post something maybe with a little rant in, in between. I'll cover the case and um, I'm kind of free with my opinions. I don't really apologize for that, but um, like Kelsey Jean Schilling was one that I got mad about and then Megan Renee Fogel song was another case that I blogged about that I was pretty mad. I actually contacted her mom. I was in contact with her mom and helped her mom get some publicity on the Unsolved Mystery site and so on for that case. So it, it just kind of depends. Regarding Tammy Leppert, and the listeners should know that, of course, the listeners realize I usually talk to a family member. In this case, I'm talking to you, but you have talked to some of Tammy's family, specifically a mm -hmm. couple of her, a couple of her sisters, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But why Tammy Leppert? Why write about her? I, I think it largely has to do with probably the Unsolved Mysteries that they did a case on, or did a segment on Tammy a long time ago, and uh, when I was little, I was, like I said, I was really into the paranormal aspects So like Pencil Mysteries. If it didn't have something that was paranormal, like UFOs or Bigfoot, I wasn't really interested. But her case always did, was one of the ones that grabbed me when I was little, even if it wasn't one of those cases that I was interested in. I was really fascinated by the way they presented that case. So um, I think it could have been that. It could be the fact that she was a real beautiful young lady, too, and that'll catch a young boy's attention, I suppose. So it could be both of those or whatnot. I'm not, sh I'm not really sure. But I noticed one case that I followed over the years, it, it, it just didn't make sense to me, the way they presented it. And come to find out after doing research, Unsolved Mysteries really didn't present it correctly. Yeah. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, we're going to, and we're going to, I think you're going to be uh, able to tell listeners quite a bit about that, and maybe open their eyes a little bit. Of course, they've heard me talk about uh, the show Disappeared that tends to leave things out. In fact, in the April Pitzer case, I think they hold, mm -hmm. totally ruined the story. In your case, you're going to get to talk about Unsolved Mysteries and what you discovered once you started getting into Tammy's case. Um, you had an opportunity to talk to her sisters, Debbie and Suzanne. Um, mm -hmm. I think they've both helped you along in all mm -hmm. of this. Absolutely. And they they know that, uh, that you've written about this case. They know that you've been that you've been in contact with me. What have you learned about Tammy as a person? By all accounts and what I've read and what her sisters have told me, um, only one of her sisters I've spoken with actually grew up with her, and that's Debbie. Suzanne was adopted out and never grew up with Tammy and, and learned about all this after Tammy disappeared, uh, I believe, in the mid-90s. So she met Linda Curtis, uh, Tammy's mom, before she passed away, but she never met Tammy herself. But that hasn't kept her from um, researching the case, and she's done a really good job. Both of them have, but Suzanne has had more of the online presence in terms of trying to track down what may have happened to her sister. Um, she uh, has a couple websites, and both sisters have a Facebook page dedicated to finding their sisters. So uh, Debbie's the one that grew up with her, but from by all accounts and what I've read and what I've been told, um, she was a very friendly uh, young lady. Despite how beautiful she was, she really didn't look down on anybody. Um, I remember reading, and I, and I heard this from Debbie as well, when she was nine years old, she had actually won a, a beauty pageant, something like that. It was a beauty pageant talent contest, something along those lines. And um, the actual person that was doing um, the narrating or the host or whatever that does a microphone and announces the person, he actually called the wrong name who won. Tammy won, but um, he called the wrong name. And... Um, so they were going to actually correct it, and uh, Tammy just let her win because she didn't want to break the lady's heart. She was nine years old at the time, and she ended up surrendering the crown and letting that lady win because they called her name first. So that can kind of tell you a lot, even at nine years old, how how uh, unselfish Tammy was. She was pretty pretty amazing. She kind of got along with everybody, and I haven't heard anybody uh, really say anything bad or negative about Tammy. She seemed to be a pretty remarkable young lady that had a – uh, career path that was uh, looked pretty pretty bright in front of her. So yeah, and she was only eighteen when she disappeared. So yeah, she had yeah, a lot of 18. years in front of her. Of course, she would be in her fifties um, by this time in two thousand seventeen. 
Now, we do need to talk about uh, another uh, something that's maybe a little more complex before we get into her disappearance. And you had mentioned uh, Tammy's mother, Linda Curtis. Tammy and Linda had a more complex relationship than I think Tammy had with other people. What can you tell the listeners about that? Linda was definitely a, a unique mom, um, and I'm putting that nicely. Her her relationship with her mom, Linda Curtis, Linda Curtis happened to be her uh, her agent as well, so she was a mother on top of being Tammy's agent. Um, it was definitely a tumultuous or, or kind of like a turbulent relationship, I guess you'd say. Linda Curtis, uh, I've been told by uh, one of... Uh, Tammy's sisters is that she could be emotionally and physically abusive at times. Um, she had a lot of, of, of issues. Um, Linda Curtis, um, uh, for instance, there was one time uh, I remember Debbie telling me that um, Tammy, and there was no time and date to this, but Tammy and a friend were supposed to attend a party for some reason, and it was somewhere in Florida. Uh, and um, Tammy got there with the friend, and apparently when she got at the party, the male people that were at the party expected certain favors from Tammy and her friend. And Tammy did not know this in advance. And apparently this happened more on more than one occasion. Well, Tammy was understandably, you know, disgusted by this and called her mom and, and thought her mom didn't know anything about it, but her mom informed her and, and in some way, basically to do what you got to do. So, you know, so in a um, way, you might look into this and say that maybe Tammy's mom might have been pimping her out? Yeah, you could definitely take it that way. Absolutely. Okay. And, and that, from what I understand, I, is, Tammy and her friend left the party. So, I mean, I'm, I would imagine, you know, disgusted and she left the party. So that created a lot of friction between the two. There was a whole lot of friction between the two. I imagine being a mom and being an agent. I, I don't know how... I'm sure it can be done, but I'm not sure how you could actually objectively do that. I'm sure it can be done, but I don't think a lot of people could probably do that. And at one point, you've learned in looking into Linda Curtis, Tammy's mother, that somebody called Linda Curtis a con artist. Yeah, a couple people did that I spoke with. A couple I've spoken to one of the the models that will come up prominently here later on when we speak of Keith Roberts, but... Um, the last person to see her live, but um, apparently, um, yeah, she was known as a, I, I guess I'm using an exact quote, as a very bad con man or con woman. She basically, um, she she owned um, a, a production company on Merritt Island called Galaxy Productions or Galaxy Model Workshop, and it says in newspaper reports that she had a reputation for turning young talent into stars, but there's not, I can't find anybody that she ever did that to besides Tammy. Um, Tammy was on the rise to become something like that, but uh, a lot of people that she represented, she kind of took their money and and, and they didn't go anywhere, or she'd hired a person, like after Tammy's disappearance, there was a person that went to school with her and ended up becoming a private investigator, and she kind of hired him to do some looking into Tammy's case, and he never saw, you know, a dime after all of his work, so Um, yeah, she's been Described as a, a really bad con, con man, con woman, however you want to say it. Being that I have an entertainment background, those kind of people have been around long before Linda Curtis. And, and now I know in 2017, those kind of con artists in entertainment still exist. It's not so unusual, mm. especially when you talk about talent agencies and, and places like that. Mm-hmm. Let's... Let's move on a little bit. Now, if the, the people don't know, and in part of the um, publicity for this episode, if you, the listeners saw, I talked about the movie Scarface. If you ever watched the movie Scarface, Tammy Leppert is in that movie. You see an, mm-hmm. the scene toward the beginning where Al Pacino goes up there and he's handcuffed in that bathroom and his friend is getting cut up with a chainsaw. His partner is down waiting at the car and there's a girl, a blonde in a blue bikini in that scene. You can find it on mm-hmm. YouTube, elsewhere. That is Tammy Leppert. If you didn't know mm-hmm. that, that's who we're talking about for this episode. So having said that, what was going on in the months before Tammy disappeared? She was doing um, some professional work, but she was having uh, also some personal problems as well. What can t- you tell the listeners about that? Well, if we go back to the Scarface on the 
I, I've learned that I guess the the filming of Scarface was from November twenty second of eighty two to um, May I think it was sixth of eighty three, and then when I go back to read reports, it says on the fourth day of filming. So I don't know how to take that. Um, you know, fourth day of filming of I don't know what scene, but apparently she had a breakdown or so on set of the Scarface um, movie, and apparently it did. It may have been the scene right at, like, I haven't, like I said, we talked before, I've I maybe seen Scarface in and out, maybe, uh, I didn't really pay attention, my buddy was more into the movie than I was, it wasn't a movie that I was really into, okay. but there was a scene, I think, right after that, right, that she, um, that they killed the guy that she may have been talking to or something like that, you might need to refresh my memory. Uh, they were the partner that she's talking to goes up to, actually, Al Pacino, he gets Al Pacino out of trouble, but yes, the, it is a gory scene in the movie, yes. Yeah, apparently during the filming of that scene, they use obviously artificial blood and so on, and she had a complete meltdown on the set. It, it scared her very badly, and apparently, uh, if I remember correctly, they were filming it in California at the time, and she was staying with the family lawyer who actually resided out there, uh, from what I understand, uh, Walter Leibowitz, who is an interesting fellow. Yeah, we'll um, talk about him later. A yes. real shady character, to say the least. But she was staying with him. He had a, she had a breakdown, and and then she actually quit. So um, from what I understand, she quit filming. So I don't know if she had any more scenes planned for the movie going forward, or if she was done. I'm not sure. But either way, she she quit and had a breakdown, and and that was about four months or so before she uh, she ended up disappearing. So. But this 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 breakdown that you're talking about on the set, this was an ongoing thing, wasn't it for her? She was having. Well, that was kind of the start. That was kind of the start of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, if if you read into reports, and I don't read, see, because like, a, there's a lot of misinformation, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of misinformation, a lot of information you have to take with a grain of salt because there's a lot of statements out there made, and that there's not a whole lot of corroboration for them. But apparently, she was in another movie. Um, it was uh, spring break in July of '82, and it was they just got done uh, filming it. And supposedly in July, this is exactly a year before, around a year before she disappeared, she went unchaperoned to some kind of a party, and um, she they say that she came back a different person. So if if you take it from what they're saying. From what Linda, that's what Linda's claim is, mm-hmm. that she never came back. After, she came back after that a different person. The stuff really started to ramp up after the Scarface incident, and, and um, after that, um, I guess she was really paranoid. Um, she would not eat from open containers or um, drink from open containers. Eat from them. She'd have other people taste her food for that was on her plate. She wouldn't eat from her plate. She'd switch the plates out. She was, it's even mentioned in the police report. The police report, part of it is on one of Suzanne's websites and I got a link to it on my blog about the case. Mm -hmm. But um, her mother did mention that she thought somebody was trying to poison her. And did you then talk to, you first, did, what did Debbie have to say about this? You've been in contact with her as well. Does, since she was the one who was actually around Tammy, does she remember this stuff? Well, during the time that Tammy was having her issues, she wasn't living with um, her mother at the time. She actually lived out in California, and, of course, Tammy lived in Florida. So um, she doesn't remember a whole lot. She, there's a lot of stuff um, that Linda kept from Debbie, the stuff that she didn't learn until afterwards. Okay. So during the time that she had her mental kind of emotional breakdown, um, Debbie wasn't around. She got one call from Tammy. Uh, before she disappeared, asking her if she can come out to live with her um, for a little bit. And Debbie said, it, said that she sounded real cautious, but um, she said she might be having some work out in California regarding movie roles, and that's something that Linda stated too, but I've never been able to corroborate for what roles or anything like that. Debbie really wasn't around during all of this. So a lot of this is coming from Linda Curtis, who... May or may not be a believable source in all of this. We just we just don't know. But yeah, and, and you'll come to find out, especially after her actions with, you know, um, the lawsuit and so on. Going, right. You know. Okay. So that was going on in the months before, including the Scarface uh, movie production. But in the weeks and days before, let's start with this. Let's talk about her conversation with. Uh, a guy, his name is Rick Adams. She, he was friends with her. 
and you had a ta chance to talk to Rick. What did he say about Tammy in the days, if not weeks, before she disappeared? Uh, I didn't speak to Rick at length like I did her sisters, uh, but um, most of uh, what Rick told me was that, um, well, we discussed Tammy directly. You can see a lot of what he says, the Unsolved Mystery segments on YouTube, but basically what he said on the Unsolved Mystery segment, and I believe he may have discussed it. I had, I've had one message. He sent me one message. I sent him one message, and I hadn't heard from him since. So, mm -hmm. uh, But he basically stated that um, on the Unsolved Mystery segment that Tammy was um, – or in the newspaper reports, because the Unsolved Mystery segment is pretty bad. But according to news reports, I'm going to say news reports, he said that Tammy went with him to church. Um, and she was crying, and, and he said that the, the fear that she had was real, and it wasn't anything drug-related. Tammy was drug-free, and she was not known to be involved with drugs or anything like that. So um, she's, he went to church with her. She went to church with him the night prior to her disappearance, and I guess they had a plan to have a date the, the same day, same night or day she disappeared. And uh, he called to verify that the date was still on, and, and she had already left, um, and he hadn't seen her, hadn't seen her since. But they were, uh, you can describe them as very good friends. He, they went to each other's prom together. They weren't real serious. They did date, um, but um, I think he was, from what I understand, he was pretty brokenhearted about it all, even though they weren't um, an item or anything like that. They were pretty good friends, and and Tammy was somebody that confided, she confided with Rick. She trusted Rick, and Rick stated that he never really wanted anything from her. Most people that see a beautiful young lady like that that may be going places will try to befriend her for obvious reasons, and Rick just wasn't that way. But he did notice in those weeks before, he noted that there was a change in her. There was something going yeah, on. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely some paranoia, somebody after her, like you said, somebody trying to poison her. And is it true – uh, I, I don't have it in my notes who told you this, but we talked about it in a prior conversation that she started sleeping with a knife under her bed. Is that true? Yeah, I, I heard about that. I did read that, uh, but I believe that was a claim from Keith Roberts, and don't quote me on that. I didn't put much credence. I didn't make notes on that, and, I, and that tells me, I think, that I didn't lend much credence to that. Mm. So um, okay. I did hear that, but I, I don't know. I didn't lend much credence to that particular theory. Because uh, I believe that came from Keith Roberts, and I'll have to check that a little bit. But I'm pretty sure that came to Keith Roberts and not, not Rick okay. Adams. Okay, and we're going to talk about Keith Roberts here in a moment. Uh, is it possibly also true that Tammy, once again in those months probably before, that she might have been committed, committed to a psych ward? She was, actually. Um, her mother forcibly put her in a psychiatric facility in Brevard, uh, Florida, Brevard County, Florida, um, for a 72-hour evaluation. They did tests on Tammy to see if there was any drugs or alcohol in her system uh, with blood blood tests and urine tests, and they all came back negative. She wasn't on any drugs, apparently. And this is before, of course, before the era of, of uh, HIPAA and um, all the privacy laws. So uh, that's when the police report with Linda Curtis, uh, I believe she put down a police report that there were no drugs or alcohol in the system, that she did have some emotional and maybe mental issues going on, but it wasn't related to drugs or, or alcohol okay. or anything like that. Okay, so no sign, I guess, of maybe of drugs of the time, maybe like cocaine was a you know a big thing in the early 80s. No sign of that in her system, no alcohol in her system. Uh, no prescription drugs that she might have been ODing on that may have, maybe could have caused her to have paranoia, nothing like that. No, from what I understand, she was a real clean living person. So I don't believe at all that there was any kind of alcohol or foreign substance, drugs or anything like that related to her, 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 her emotional issues. Let's talk about Keith Roberts. Uh, he's the guy who allegedly was the last person to see Tammy. Tell the listeners uh, how he knew Tammy first of all, and you know what was he, what was it going on in his life at that time in 1983. Well, um, there wasn't a whole lot on Keith Roberts. I've only discovered out more about him real recently, um, but uh, he was uh, a little bit older than Tammy. He was about 24, if I remember correctly. Um, she was 18 at the time. They get, I guess they met. This is according to one of his ex-wives. 
uh, Keith Roberts, who I spoke with last week or so, sometime recently, last week, yeah. Um, but he was actually a male model at um, Linda Curtis's Galaxy's Production or Galaxy Model Workshop, whatever you want to call it, on Merritt Island. That's how he and Tammy met. Uh, subsequent news reports have stated that he had worked as a um, worked at a bank, and he was a, a car salesman as well. Um, of the only I've been able to come to, and from what I've been told, is that they met at the Linda Curtis's uh, business, and she at one point represented him. I, I don't know exactly how. Well, I know he's a male model, but that that's how I know they met. There's been speculation. And I know you know about her relationship with Roberts. It could have been something more. I'm not sure. My my opinion is that there was something more to that. It wasn't a friend. It was more than that. But um, I have not been able to confirm that from anybody else. Right. I mean, it would not be uh, it might not be unusual. A guy who is a male model, 23, 24, knowing a young woman who is also a, a model getting together it's not totally out of the realm of possibility they might have had no, something going not. on between the both of them of course absolutely not especially if you consider when i was doing research on keith roberts that in 1979 when he was 18 he was married once in 1979 at 18 to another 18 year old but in 1985 he was um 25 or almost going 26 somewhere in that range and he married a 17 year old girl so um, if you take that into consideration, he definitely liked younger women at, at one point or another. Okay, his, t- his, that's taste, what I'm his taste ran younger. Mm-hmm. So what what is the story from that day? What does Keith Roberts say happened the day that Tammy Leppert disappeared? And that would be July 6th, 1983. What's his story from that day? Well, according to Linda Curtis in the police report, Tammy had Keith – pick her up, and I guess he was in, um, I believe it was Lakeland or Orlando. He came and picked her up. It was a couple couple hour drive away. Um, She said she was going to the beach and she'd be back in a while. When she didn't show back up, I guess Linda Curtis filed a missing persons report on Tammy four days later. She stated in the police report that he told her after she called him, because Tammy, getting heard from Tammy, I don't know exactly when the call happened. I'm assuming it was sometime that day, maybe the next day, somewhere around that range. He stated that they two got into an argument soon after he picked her up, and he dropped her two blocks south of what was then the glass bank, and he hadn't heard from her since. Let's break that down, just that part that you've gone through, first of all. Uh, the the listeners should understand that Lakeland, where Keith Roberts lived, is about, like you said, two hours. So for Ooh. some reason... Tammy calls this guy she knows who lives two hours away. She wants to talk to him, see him for some reason. He comes over. Mm -hmm. He picks her up. What is she wearing? Uh, Did it look like they were going to the beach? Or what was their destination? Were they going to drive around? Do we even know any of that? No, we don't. uh, Honestly, uh, I've read... Um, that she was going to the beach, but she wasn't dressed, I guess. I mean, you're from Florida, and we discussed this earlier. Mm-hmm. She was dressed in a blue shirt with white flowers at the shoulders, a blue denim skirt, a, and she had a gray purse and flip-flops on. So um, you're from the area, and you said that that's not really dressed to go to the beach. So. Uh, not in my opinion, being from Madeira Beach, Florida, no. It, 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 there's no – you don't hear anything about towels. You don't hear anything about her – Wearing a bikini underneath her clothes, you don't hear anything about sunscreen. You know, it seems to me, as far as the description goes, if this is from the police report, this is just uh, a young lady who's going out to lunch for the day. Right, right. And I would have to agree with that based on mm-hmm. what you've told me. I've not lived in a, a climate like that. So, but it, interesting, it kind of, um, Linda Cruz elaborates on the story. And, and subsequent news articles over the years. Uh, there's one interesting statement that she made in one of the Florida Today articles. Florida Today was like one of the only, I mean, other newspapers did the story, but most of the story is relegated to Florida and Florida Today. It really didn't get national news attention until I saw Mysteries did it. And then they did a pretty sloppy job, but it mostly stayed basically around Florida. Florida Today, and I believe the reporter is Billy Cox, if I remember correctly. He's the one that pretty much kept the story alive for years. But in, in when they interviewed her, she ended up passing away in 95, but 
during the time that she went missing and, and between that and when Linda passed away, she elaborated a little bit more and her, her, her theories ended up getting a little more wilder and we'll go into that. But mm-hmm. one thing she made, one statement that she made in one of the newspaper articles is that she was, she stated Linda or I'm sorry, Linda stated Tammy was having some emotional and physical problems and that Keith came to pick her up so they could quote unquote talk things out. Hmm. So emotional and physical problems. And I was told by um, Suzanne, apparently uh, now Debbie disputes. This This is one of the things that they dispute. Uh, They're both really nice, nice uh, ladies. I've I've spoken with them at length, so I don't have anything bad to say about them, but they, they have a different theory and different story on what they think happened. But according to Suzanne, um, during, I, I imagine it might have been at the, uh, the time that she stayed, she had a 72-hour stay at the mental facility, what Linda made her do. Mm-hmm. There may have been a pregnancy test that was given to Tammy, and Tammy might have been uh, around three months pregnant at the time. Hmm. And when I read, when, when she told me that, and I, re- I reread some of the articles, I make it a habit. Anytime I come across anything new, I go back and read through the articles again just to make sure. And I came across that statement that kind of when, when she said physical, emotional and physical problems. And then you have one of the sisters say that she she was pregnant. That kind of leads you to believe something else. Of course. Of course. You, you, I guess you could read into it that Tammy's pregnant. She thinks Keith is the father. And she's calling him to come over there, and she's going to break the news to him. I think that's something that's very reasonable to think. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Debbie disputes it. She thinks that if Tammy was pregnant, that she would have told her when she called her the at the time before she disappeared. There's she never, she ne- that never to... came up. That never came up with Debbie, though. No, that never came up with Debbie at all. Okay. But uh, apparently when, when the test was given, I think she took multiple tests from what Suzanne told me. And then they all came back positive pregnancy tests. And, and like I said, she took blood and urine tests. Urine tests would be a way to tell if you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. So I guess when the doctor informed Linda of this, Tammy was really upset because she didn't want Linda to know, apparently. Tammy is a big part of Linda's income. And, in fact, she was the only income Linda had. So that could be the reason why Tammy didn't want Linda to know. Okay. Now there are, and you just – we just – uh, talked about this a little bit uh, before the interview. There's a little bit of a discrepancy as to the times that Tammy called Keith, the time that he ended up in Rockledge, Florida, Merritt mm-hmm. Island area of Florida, to see Tammy. What can you tell the listeners about that? Because in one way, it seems like there's some hours missing in there, and the other, there doesn't seem to be any time missing in there. What can you tell the listeners about that? Yeah, and that's something I ran across, and I, and I actually messaged you right before we started the interview, mm-hmm. is I was rereading some of the material, and I went back to the police report, and all the other accounts that I've read are most of them anyway. Um, it says that she was picked up around 11 a.m., but according to Linda Curtis, she was picked up at around anywhere around 1 p.m. that day, so there seems to be a two-hour discrepancy, and and I have to give you credit with this. When you when you, when I told you this initially, and I gave you the 11 a.m. quote, you actually went on Google Maps, and you did how long would it take to get from Lakeland to mm-hmm. to Rockledge, and it was around two hours. So yeah. So the police report, though, that is from Linda. the 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 only way the the police report would the only reason the police report would say that is because Linda said that, and we don't because know Linda if she that. can entirely be believed in this situation. Correct. Yeah, she. Okay. As we'll go into later, she she has a host of different theories as to what happened to Tammy. So. Right. Right. So we we're not sure that if. What time does Keith say that he dropped off Tammy near this bank? And the, if the listeners don't know, the glass bank is kind of um, at the time it was kind of a landmark in that area. It had a very unique design to it. In fact, there's a very good documentary about the glass bank that you can find on YouTube. If some guy ended up living in the, like the penthouse of it, very fascinating kind of strange story. But what time did Keith say that he dropped Tammy off at the glass bank? See, I'm not sure he's been pretty hush hush over the years. To my understanding, I don't believe he's ever quoted. See, later on, he was, um, later on down the road, years later, 
He canceled two face-to-face -face interviews with the police. He didn't want to talk to them. Unsolved Mysteries even approached him and asked him to do some type of questioning on the show, and he, and he declined to do it. And his conversations with the police, um, the police quoted as saying they were um, non short and nonspecific, whatever that means. So he hasn't elaborated a whole lot on what happened. He, he's um, repeated what everybody else has basically said, that the way she acted was real paranoid, and she's going to go on some issues. And he said that she wanted to leave. She told Rick Adams that she might be going away for a while the night before she, she went missing. Um, and Keith said that she had some issues at home and, and from what the police have done in terms of, they haven't done a whole lot, but during the time that she went missing, they talked to several friends and they stated that she, they felt that she had issues at home and she wanted to leave. So I don't believe that Keith Roberts ever actually quoted. He has been pretty hush hush about the whole thing. So, um, but uh, some reports, like I said, I've read have stated 11 AM, but the police report said 1 PM. So it's hard mm -hmm. to know exactly what time. All right, so he's saying that he picked her up. They're driving around. Maybe they went somewhere. They start getting into a fight. He drops her off somewhere near the glass bank, and he never sees her again. And Correct. did he ever call Linda? We can go over this again. Did, did he ever call Linda to say that, hey, Tammy and I got in a fight and I dropped her off, anything like that? Or is it understanding that he just drove back to Lakeland, Florida? From what I understand, she called him, and, and he told her that he got in an argument, and he dropped her off two blocks south of Glass Bank, and that's pretty much it. And she thought that he knew more than he was leading on, uh, that, that he was giving her, uh, and uh, that's pretty pretty much it. And, he he's, much and he was not very forthcoming with the police. No, the police didn't consider him a suspect. They've been quoted as saying that we believe that he's done nothing wrong at the time, that there's been no evidence that she's been taken anywhere against her will. And even at the time, um, which I can't corroborate, but I, I know that afterwards this is not true, but they stated that he, there was nothing um, that Linda Curtis said about Keith that ever came true. At the time, they're quoted about in like maybe the late 80s, early 90s, that he had no criminal history, no – Nothing in his background. Uh, he was pretty clean. So I've, I've come to find out later on, according to one of his ex-wives, that that's not the case. So All right, we're going to get into that. Yes. So what what happened? Did, did the police do a search, or did they think that Tammy ran away? What did Debbie do? What did Linda do? Of course, Suzanne was in California at the time. Debbie um, was in California. Right. Okay. Um, what? What um what did they do? Did they organize any searches, or did they just think that Tammy just simply ran away? Did they give up? What happened? According to Harold Lewis, who was, I believe he was the police chief in charge um, at the time of her disappearance, he stated that, um, his, by his opinion, that she just uh, up and left. Um, he did say, I believe I read that they handed out flyers at one point, but uh, basically they, they treated it. As Tammy was 18 at the time, if she wanted to leave, you know how it is. The police are with you when you're an adult. If you do, they're going to look at it from a perspective if they have every right to leave if they want to and not and not contact you. However, I have not been able to get an exact date on this, but Harold Lewis stated that he did receive two calls from a lady um, on Tammy's behalf, stating that she is fine and that she would contact her family when the time is right. And then he said he got another call. Again, I don't know the dates. He never elaborated, but he stated that Tammy is fine and that she's fulfilling a lifelong dream of becoming a nurse, which was very odd mm -hmm. considering the fact that she had that breakdown on the set of, of Scarface with blood. So, But, you know, I had, I had a friend that was scared of blood and became a nurse too, so I don't know. But Yeah, if you want to do something with your life, sometimes fears have to be overcome. So, right. right, well, I guess we're all, I mean, I guess every nurse was afraid of, needles at one time in his or her life maybe they were little kids and they they grow out of it that's just the way uh life works I'm just, I'm just thinking that you know at the time i mean you eventually would maybe overcome it but at the time for her experiencing those issues i don't think it would be a, a best time to think about becoming a nurse you know i don't know and you said that you did not know exactly when he couldn't exactly remember when those two calls uh came in but we also know on the other hand that he had that position up through 1985, something like that. So it had to have been no longer than two years after Correct. Tammy disappeared. Yeah, right. Okay. Right, and after after he left and be, did to do something else, a new 
person became in charge and his name was Jim Scrag. And um, he's still involved in Florida in one way. Well, at least he was a judge at one point in Florida. I think he's retired now. But he was the one that wanted to question Roberts and, and to call him in to question him. He wanted, fit, he wanted to meet Keith Roberts face to face and ask him. Um, and Keith Roberts broke two face to face appointments with the police to discuss the Tammy aspect or Tammy Lynn's disappearance with them. Um, and he said that concerned him greatly. And he also is quoted as saying that Roberts was never properly interrogated. Let's go back. Um, let's backtrack just a little bit to the day that Tammy disappeared. There was the, the, a rumor out there that maybe possibly Tammy had made some phone calls after that day after Keith allegedly dropped her off. What do you make of these phone calls that I guess in 1983 she would have had to have made maybe from a pay phone or she walked into some store or something to use a phone. Do you, do yeah. you have, do you believe those calls? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, from what I understand, and this is from Linda. So again, you want to take it with a grain of salt, but apparently according to her, her, her aunt Ginger owned a store called balloon attacks. I guess it was like a party, like some like party city then. And she owned it costume party place, something like that. I guess she had made three urgent calls to her Aunt Ginger's store. Um, I have a problem with this. Um, first off, um, the same, it supposedly made the same day that Tammy supposedly disappeared. Linda Curtis doesn't mention that in the police report from what I've seen. Now, again, I've only seen part of the police report, but that's probably one of the first things that I wrote down. Uh, she said that, according to her Aunt Ginger, according to what Linda Curtis said, her Aunt Ginger said that she sounded a sca uh, scared and, and afraid. And uh, there's been nothing, there's been no elaboration whatsoever on what these phone calls or voicemails supposedly said. Um, the police have never mentioned them at all. So, do I mean, I uh, do, police... Sin do Suzanne and Debbie believe these calls happened? Suzanne, um, Suzanne does. She believes they happened, from what I understand from when we talked. Okay. She does believe that they occurred. I, I have a different opinion. I don't believe that they, they are made. I think that Linda was trying to put pressure on Keith by saying that later on. And I think the police would have may have taken her her uh, missing persons report a little more seriously if she had stated that. And by all accounts, the original, the police investigation or lack thereof, they basically had the opinion that Tammy had some issues at home and she wanted to get away. And that came from her friends and and some other things too. So I, I have a hard time believing that those calls actually occurred. Okay. Were there any sightings of Tammy uh, that day or any days after July 6th, 1983? Yeah, there was quite a few. Um, not that we, none of them could be taken seriously, but the ones that are probably somewhat interesting are the, the hitchhiking. One, I guess there was one that said that she was seen hitchhiking, which I have a problem with that, too. I mean, this is one person, and in the area of Florida they're in, it's pretty busy. The time of day is pretty busy, and only one person stated they saw her. And I think you can agree with me, Tammy's pretty striking. I think more than one person mm -hmm. would see her. I, I agree. Uh, um, so I have a problem with that. I, I did read somewhere. I've not been able to corroborate the hitchhiker one or the fact that she was um, seen at a bank um cashing a check and that goes back to the the roberts thing a little bit which i uh, apparently he stated that he gave her three hundred dollars and then before he dropped her off i've heard where i've heard both sides of where he owed tammy that money and then tammy owed him that money so i don't know what to make of it but i did talk to his ex-wife like i said one of his ex-wives and she stated that she does not believe for a second that keith roberts handed three hundred dollars over to Tammy before he dropped her off because he never had that kind of money to give away. So we have her disappear. Keith Roberts said he dropped her off. They got into an argument. He dropped her off and she just seemingly vanishes into thin air. Maybe she wanted to get away. Maybe she wanted to go LA and maybe continue her acting career. Of course, if she did, she must have done it under a, a new name, a, a different name, uh, an alias, I guess you'd call it. Or she wanted to go be a nurse, run away. Maybe she just wanted to get away because her mother, well, she and her mother didn't get along the greatest. And it seems like her mother wasn't the best person. And then less than two years later, this Detective Lewis gets these couple phone calls that 
Tammy's doing just fine, and she's fulfilled this dream of becoming a nurse. What did Detective Lewis think about those calls? He believed them, didn't he? Uh, from what I read, he believed them. Um, and what he's quoted as saying is that he thinks that she just up and left. Uh, I don't think he took her being missing very seriously. I think uh, the, his his uh, successor probably took it a little more seriously. Like I said, he wanted to question Roberts. From what Lewis has been quoted, which is not a whole lot, he seemed to believe that um, it, it's, it's interesting that he said it was uh, a person, I believe it was a female or a lady on behalf of Tammy, mm. which is odd. So he didn't, I guess he didn't even speak to Tammy or if he did, you can propose a scenario that Tammy wanted to get away from her mom. She didn't want law enforcement on her back. She called the police department and stated, hey, I'm fine. Don't let them know I talked to you, but I don't want to be, I want to be left alone. And he could have just added that aspect in there. I don't personally buy it, but that's one way you can look at it. And since 1983, as far as the police are concerned, have there been any significant new development in the disappearance of Tammy Leppert? None whatsoever. Um, like I said, Tammy's mom hired um, uh, a classmate or a person that went to school with Tammy. I won't say his name. You can probably look it okay. up and read it. But, okay. Um, it's fine. He said that during the Unsolved Mysteries segment, um, they got around 300 tips, all that were it was just trash. It wasn't anything. He said of the reliable tips, he could probably count. Uh, or all of the interesting tips or the ones that he thinks that were interesting or whatever. They could count those on one hand, and he said he wasn't holding his breath. So, and Unsolved um, Mysteries was a very popular show. Uh, do you happen to remember the year that that episode might have come out? I know we could find it on YouTube and elsewhere now, but do you know how close that was to the disappearance of Tammy that the episode came out? Uh, it was years after. I want to say 1990 or 91. I don't say 90 off the top of my head. So. And there's interesting things about the whole Unsolved Mysteries segment, too, that just doesn't – apparently – Yeah, I mean, why don't you – why don't we get into that now. right now, and then we'll go into maybe some of these people and some of the theories. Sure. Give – let okay. the people know a little bit about the behind-the-scenes of the Tammy Leppert episode of Unsolved Mysteries. This isn't really related to the actual episode itself, but the way, the way Unsolved Mysteries did their segments in terms of like if they're looking for like a missing person or – or they're on a, a case or something like that, and they're trying to solve it, they would deliberately not tell you correct information. And the reason they did that was so that they could actually root out all the weirdos that would call into the call centers and, and act like they knew something. So if I remember correctly, the Unsolved Mysteries segment stated that she was barefoot with no purse when he dropped her off at Glass Bank, and that's not true at all. Um, she had flip-flops, and she had a purse at the time. But they did that on purpose so that when the, when it, those idiots call and mess up everything, mm. they could root them out. So, right. uh, so like that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of conflicting information between the actual segment of Tammy and what really happened. That's why. Um, I don't know how reliable that approach is, but that's not you know that wasn't my decision. But anyways, um, according to Debbie, and this is also Rick. Okay, according to Rick Adams. Um, Linda wanted complete control of the Unsolved Mysteries segment, uh, so much so that at the time they did the segment, Debbie was back from California and living with her mom. Um, she asked her to go outside and not be involved. She didn't want her to hear anything in the segment or anything. Rick Adams was allowed to do it, but she, uh, according to him, she was really picky about what he said and what was used. Like I said, Keith Roberts ended up backing out of the and he he said that was because of the proposed questioning he stated that the questions that were being asked were do you think Linda had something to do with it and he said he did not want to throw uh, like he wouldn't he didn't go on the show to throw mud so he kind of deflected it a little bit and he didn't want anything to do with it but um, Linda apparently wanted complete control of the segment and um, come to find out sometimes on Unsolved Mysteries, so well, a lot of the times, law enforcement would have it stay, um, meaning they would come on with the segments and tell you what was involved with the case and, and, and some facts on the case. On that particular case, the Cocoa Beach Police Department did not want to share anything with Linda at all. And I, the only way I can read that is 
to think that they may have think she may have had something to do with it. I don't know. But they did not want any anything shared with Linda Curtis in terms of any leads or anything regarding their file on the disappearance of Tammy Lynn Lippert. How did you find and that you out? Into, How did you find that out? Uh, from the newspaper, newspaper article on the Unsolved Mysteries segment. I believe it was Florida Today. I wonder how they found they that out. I wonder how they found that out. That's Well, uh, the producer of the segment stated that the, that um, they weren't going to be involved in the segment. And the actual private investigator that Tammy had, quote-unquote, hired that didn't pay. Had Linda, a, Linda, had hired that didn't, Linda hired that didn't pay. Linda hired that didn't yeah. pay. Linda hired him. Excuse me. Linda hired him. Um, he had some kind of a, I guess you would call a relationship with the police regarding the case at some point, and they didn't want him sharing anything that he may have learned. I don't believe they gave him any information, but in case he had gotten information, they didn't want him sharing it with Linda Curtis either. So, as you'll notice if you watch the segment, there is no law enforcement uh, person on that segment at all. Okay. Which is rather odd on a disappearance case. Most disappearance cases that they feature would have some kind of a law enforcement or some kind of official on there, but that one didn't. That's very interesting. So the police wanted to keep information away from Tammy's mother for the Unsolved Mysteries episode. We, I do, I guess we just don't know. We, we don't know how common that is. Uh, maybe that happens in some of the happened in some of the other episodes that Unsolved Mysteries uh, did. But at this time, it does sound a little, at least a little suspicious. Um, it does. Let's move on to Keith Roberts, the guy who allegedly last saw Tammy. What have you learned about him? You've mentioned we've maybe put the theory out there that maybe he was the father of Tammy's child. Found out that pregnant, he was right. that um, he was married when he was very young, and then a few years later, after uh, Tammy disappeared, he married a, a girl who was only seventeen. You, and you, you've gotten to talk to that woman uh, these days um, recently. Um, mm -hmm. What have you learned about him? He's not exactly a fine, upstanding citizen, is he? No, he's not. Not at all, actually. Uh, as a matter of fact, I actually end up coming across the fact that as of the 5th of this month of August of this year, he was rearrested. And I actually got a mugshot of him. He's been pretty off the radar. He has no social media or digital footprint, really, any kind of presence like that. And I actually, I never even knew what he looked like, but uh, it's a long way away from the quote-unquote male model of the 80s, I guess. But apparently he was rearrested on the 5th of August for possession of cocaine, tampering with evidence, resisting arrest. And there's one that says, I'm quoting this from his um, mugshot or whatever, it says, keep building shop vehicle for drugs, first violation. So I'm assuming that he either kept a vehicle or a shop in his uh, possession to store drugs or something, and it says first violation, so it looked like that might be his first offense for that. But he was rearrested uh, this month, and um, when I found that out, um, I actually found out his middle name. His, his full name is Keith Allen Roberts, and that kind of eluded me for a while, but I was able to put get that um, verified, Keith Allen Roberts. Unfortunately, there's a couple of them in that area, but He's the right one. I actually ended up going through some newspaper articles and, and found that I had that one article where he had married. I'm just going to call her Terry Lynn. Okay. Um, he married Terry Lynn, which is kind of interesting because Tammy Lynn and Terry Lynn, but they're different people. She's had people come up to her and ask if she – and think she's Tammy Lynn, and she's not. But um, I, was, I, I ended up getting her residential phone number, and um, I had it for maybe a couple months, and I was like, maybe I'll call – and then I, for some reason, I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to call and, and see if I can get a hold of her. And, and, and at first, when I called her, I, I got a, vo um, a voicemail box. And I started to leave a message on it. And I was like, I don't even know if this is the right person or not, but if it is, I'd like to speak with you. And right, after, right before I started to end the message, she picked up the phone, and, and we started to talk. I mean, um, and this is Terry Lynn. This is, the, this is the girl that, that Keith Roberts married in 1985. She is the seventeen-year-old from that time. Exactly. Yeah, she is the seventeen-year-old that was or was seventeen at the time. Okay. What she have to um, say? Well, she ended up marrying Keith Roberts, and um, she was married to him for a good period of time. She has two kids by him. 
Uh, but she does not have very good things to say about Mr. Roberts. Um, some interesting things that kind of shocked me because on my blog post, if you'll notice, I, I don't have a whole lot of information on Keith Roberts, so I kind of leave it hanging out there. I don't want to, you know, you know, come up with any kind of theory involving it other than I think that he may have been, if Tammy was pregnant, he may have been the father. But pretty abusive husband. Um, she told me some real interesting things. I made sure that she was okay with me stating this. I've only told you her first and middle name, but mm -hmm. um, she said she's fine with me, you know, repeating what she stated, but apparently he was very abusive physically, extremely abusive physically, actually. And every now and then, I, according to her, during the time they were married, she knew nothing about Tammy Lynn Leopard. Um, she um, didn't even know he was married before. Uh, he lied to her about that, and she found that out years later. But he would tell her certain things sometimes when he was being physically abusive, like he'll end up like Tammy. Which, she never which, knew what that meant. She didn't know what that meant, no. Uh, apparently, he had a picture of Tammy uh, that he had kept. It was a modeling photo, and sometimes he would show it to her, like, he'll end up like her or something like that along those lines. And it was only years later after she had divorced him that she she realized who Tammy was. And I guess Suzanne had contacted her several years ago, and she would spoke with her and and apparently there's a there's an age difference because she was 17 and 85 and Tammy was 18 and 83. So there's a little bit of an age difference there. But apparently at one point or another, um, she was for a very brief period um, represented by Linda Curtis for a very brief time from her Merritt Island Galaxy Productions uh, company. So mm -hmm. and she was one of the ones that said that she was not really fond of Linda Curtis either from from what I remember, I didn't get any elaboration on that. I was sticking to the Keith Roberts thing. But, yeah, apparently he was very abusive. Um, and, and he's not all, at least, now I don't know whether this was after they stated that or whatnot, but apparently um, he's not a real clean, apparently, since he was be arrested earlier this month. But he wasn't a clean, he didn't have a clean criminal background, like the police said he did. Uh, now, he may have had it at the time, but, you know, I'm not sure how truthful or how reliable that is. I don't know if whether they didn't do the research or they're taking it from word of mouth. I don't know. Basically, maybe because they think Tammy just up and left. Maybe they didn't even look at it. I don't know. But he, she told me at least one point in time that he was he he did an armed robbery of a pawn store and, and stole some very valuable coins, and he was arrested for that. He doesn't seem like to be a really a really nice guy. So what you're saying is, since Tammy disappeared in 1983, he's the last person to see her. He hasn't you know, lived and grown up to like cure cancer or anything. He's not a very good person. No, he's not. He's, he's okay. you know, and like I, when I talk to her, you have to get a feeling because this could be a bitter ex. Sure. You know, this could we be have... a person that she's sure. not. I mean, we all have exes at one point, whether they're bitter or not. So, but from what the way I've talked to people, I've talked to lots of people over the years. I used to be a customer service rep for a cellular company. So I, I can read people. I'm pretty good at it. I may not be the best, but and when I was talking to her, um, it didn't sound like she was bitter. Um, she didn't even say anything bad about him personally. She just told me what happened. I mean, you can say that yeah, he he beat you, but that's just a fact. That's not saying that he's you know a jerk or you know fill in the blank. She didn't mention him in that way at all. She just told me this is what happened. Um, so I would I'd be willing to claim that. She's telling me the truth, that she's not just saying it to say it. You also found out something interesting about Keith Roberts' uncle. What can you tell the listeners about that? Yeah, I was informed by his ex-wife, Terry Lynn, that uh, his uncle, last name Yeager, was a police officer for Melbourne in the Melbourne area. Which is over on the Atlantic coast, not mm -hmm. far from where Tammy disappeared. Correct. And like I said, I don't want to, to – that's an interesting fact, but I don't want to try to cast aspersions on somebody else's character. So, Okay. But that is something interesting. All right. And there's never – you've never read anything. Uh, Debbie or Suzanne have never said anything to the fact that they believe that there was any sort of police cover-up or anything like that. No, and, none whatsoever. Okay. No, I mean, Linda Curtis criticized the handling of her, her daughter's case, but that's about it. Okay. Let's move on. We've, we've talked quite a bit about Keith Roberts. Let's move on to some, somebody else. 
a name we've not mentioned. In fact, this person may have nothing to do with Tammy's disappearance, but uh, this guy ended up having a, uh, a very horrible criminal history, and he worked in that area at the time, and his name is Christopher, Christopher Wilder. What can you tell the listeners about him? Uh, Christopher Bernard Wilder. He was a, a serial killer that operated in the 80s. He was actually Australian, but he actually had, he may have had, uh, he, he came over here, whether he was a dual citizen or not, I don't remember correctly, but he ended up being responsible for the killing of at least 12 women. There may be others in the area. One was in Merritt Island, close um, to actually Linda's shop. He was eventually uh, apprehended and, and shot dead by police. I'm not going to cry about that one, but he may have had more um, victims, but he was a serial killer that that who abducted and raped at least 12 women. And it was a multi-state thing, I believe. It was uh, it was in Florida, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Nevada, and Florida, and even one in New York. So it was, it was a multi-state thing. At one point, Linda Curtis filed a $1 million, I believe, uh, class action lawsuit against the Wilder estate. And this is when he was, because like I said, he was shot dead by police. But she claimed at one point, this is where it gets interesting, because at one point she claimed that uh, he knew her, she knew him, and quote unquote, he was her contact. Okay. Later on, she states that if it wasn't Wilder, then he must have a twin brother. And um, she's not real sure, even despite being Tammy's agent, she's not really sure if Wilder was involved. At one point, she says she's sure. Another time, she says she must. if it's not him, he must have a twin. From what I read into that, that was an attempted money grab. Uh, she later stated after a while that she she didn't believe he had anything to do with Tammy's disappearance at all. So she said that she forced him. She was trying to force him to answer questions about Tammy, but he she couldn't have done that because he was already dead by the time she filed the lawsuit. So, and this maybe goes back to the uh, term "con artist" that was used earlier to describe her. That it was, might have been like a money grab or something like that. Because the listeners should know that Christopher Wilder, I believe, came from a, an affluent family. He was into auto racing. He was somewhat of a playboy, and he just yeah. happened to be a serial killer on top of all of that. Yeah, he was a piece of work, and like I said, I wouldn't cry him, him getting shot dead by police. I think he's the only thing I wish he, we knew is if he had any more victims, because if he did, I, I feel sorry for the families. But when you read into what Linda did, you can pretty much tell that it was a money grab, and, and like I said, con artist. Yeah. And she had made the claim that at one point to try to back this off that he had come into her agency at one time. Yeah. And... Right. That's when I said that she said that it was either him or his twin, okay. and then. Like I said, her being Tammy's agent, she don't know who she talks to. I mean, that makes no sense at all. But, but the timing might have been – yeah, the timing might have been right, though. He's never been ruled out. He hasn't been included or excluded. But the location is kind of right. The timing is kind of right. But to this day, the police have never been truly able to be able to determine if Christopher Wilder and Tammy Leppert ever crossed paths. I believe that the police did rule, rule rule him out. Actually, okay, okay. The police have ruled him out, and there was another one, Christopher Crutchley, who was known as the vampire rapist. Yes, his, his mo didn't fit, but police ruled him out as well. But it's it's it, it's one of those things where it's just it's a coincidence. Um, a lot of people don't believe in that, but they, they do happen. And he was in the area at the time, but his killing spree didn't start until maybe a year after Tammy uh, disappeared. Around then. Um, but he was charged in, in some way with uh, – in Australia with an incident with two, two, young, two young girls at one point, and I forget the actual specifics on that. So he did do stuff prior to 1984. It was in Australia. He may have done it in the States, but the ones that were accounted for so far that we know have been in 1984. So it's been after Tammy's disappearance. I know this is a touchy subject, but we have to talk about it because of the way Linda has been portrayed in this episode. And it's a way that I think that uh, Debbie and Suzanne have portrayed Linda in, the, in the, the, the talks that you've had with them. Is there any chance that Linda Curtis might have had something to do with her daughter's disappearance? I don't believe so. I mean, is there a chance? Yes. But based on what I've read and what I've researched and the people I've talked to, 
um, she was a, a really bad con artist, but I'd have a hard time putting something like that on Linda. Um, I mean, is there a chance? Eh, maybe a really small chance. But Debbie, um, from what Debbie told me, and Debbie still loves her mom. So I hate to she, – she, when I talked to her, she stated that I could use this. And mm-hmm. this has been a while ago. Okay. But Debbie stated – she said that she loved her mom. And her mom, I don't know whether – I didn't do a whole lot of research on Linda Curtis's background, only things that were related to Tammy's case. But from what I understand and what she told me, Linda loved. She just didn't know how to. Mm-hmm. So – um, maybe she had a difficult past or whatnot, but I, I'd have a hard time believing that she'd do anything to Tammy. Okay. Uh, Linda Curtis does not sound like a very good person to me, but instead she sounds like one of these showbiz moms that wants yeah, to run exactly. their kid's life, wants their kid to be in commercials and modeling and is going to be one of these helicopter parents and is going to be totally controlling. And there's many Hollywood stories uh, e Hollywood stories about child actors who had parents who are like that. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, it, I don't know, I don't know the actual tension. I know there was tension between the two, but from what I've read, by by the time Tammy got into high school, she was kind of done with modeling. Acting was her calling, I guess you would say, so to speak. I think she was kind of done with the talent, uh, with the with the modeling shows and the beauty pageants. She she would competed. And I've, I've read estimates between 300 and 400, but uh, I'm going to go with 300. But she estimated to have competed in around 300 beauty pageants, and she won 280. I mean, I think at that point, she was probably like, I don't have anything else to prove. I want to try something else. Yeah. So I don't know if that was the cause of tension between the two of them, but I know that Tammy was done, wanted to be done with that. And I'm not sure if Linda was ready for that to happen. Okay. Again, stating that, though, I don't believe Linda had anything – to do with it now i'm going to combine the the next uh two parts because the, i i think that if we're going to include one you have to put them together and that goes back to this paranoia some sort of mental issue that the tammy might have been having before she disappeared and let's combine that with the possibility that really she did run off and mm-hmm. i want you to also talk about this this rumor out there you had mentioned him earlier in the episode with on this lawyer Leibowitz and a social security number. What can you tell the listeners about all of this? Because you have to kind of like combine it into one. Of, yeah. Maybe you need to explain the listeners to what I'm talking about. Well, it's kind of a fringe theory, not much to go on, but a lot, that happens a lot in disappearance cases, I guess. But there was some mention of a Walter Leibowitz and she's the, she was the family attorney uh for linda and, and tammy and so on and she's the one that she ended up linda or uh, tammy ended up staying with while filming scarface um suzanne mentioned a couple times in posts over the years i don't believe i ever elaborated on this i don't believe i questioned her on this because i didn't put much credence to it she said something the fact that tammy may have had more than one social security number when i spoke to debbie about this debbie asked basically stated that she would not know how she would even know that so I don't think – like, again, they have different theories, but between the two of them. Um, apparently, Leibowitz, um, he was a lawyer, and he's actually been barred from practicing law in Florida. Um, and that came to fruition somehow. I don't even know exactly, but he was involved at one point, and he was actually acquitted. But the, he was acquitted of it, but he was acquitted of actually having a black market – baby adoption scheme thing going on in Florida in the 70s. And again, he was acquitted of that, but later on, I haven't done a whole lot of research on him. He's not the, the most honest kind of guy. He, he, even being acquitted of that, he's still disbarred in, in the state of Florida from practicing law. I'm not sure if he's even still um, with us at the moment, but um, there's a lot of things that he was in, involved <laughs> at one point that he tried to say that the uh, the Florida police at one point were trying to frame him because I guess they had caught him trying to steal a TV out of a of a department store. Really strange things like that. But um, there's been a conspiracy theory that he may have helped actually get Tammy a new identity or something like that with a new social security number since he was involved with the that black market baby thing. Don't mm-hmm. lend a whole lot of credence to it, but if I mean it might be possible. But if if you take into account 
Tammy's character. Like I, and one of the things I mentioned when she was nine years old, she she surrendered that one crown because that person named the wrong winner. Yeah. Tammy's mother was on her deathbed in '95, and she wanted to know what happened to her daughter. Um, I have a hard time buying the fact that if if, if her mother's on her deathbed, no matter how much um, they may have had tension, that she would not come to see her mom, or at least come out of of a supposed hiding to let her mom know she was okay. Linda Curtis passed away without ever knowing what happened to her daughter. Now, regardless of Linda Curtis's character, I can't imagine any parent having to do that. And Linda Curtis um, died in what, 1995, I believe. Yeah, in October of 95, exactly. She had a host of different health issues. She had a degenerative heart failure. She was denied, a, I believe, a heart transplant at one point. Um, she had some liver issues. She'd suffered multiple heart attacks. She died of renal failure, and she ended up having a, a – she contracted some kind of uh, – issue while getting a blood transfusion and that ended up making her making her pass away so uh, I, I don't believe i don't believe tammy and her got along they may not even tammy may not even have liked her mom but i don't believe from all accounts and from what everybody's told me tammy leopard was a very very nice person and, and a, a beautiful human being in terms of the soul and so on and i just don't see that happening i think uh, she would come out to see her mom how did tammy or the her family even know this lawyer in the first place. I mean, she stayed with him, this lawyer, during the shooting of Scarface. But how did they know each other before before then? Oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All I know is he's mentioned on the police report as their family attorney. Um, and I know that he's actually interviewed on the Unsolved Mystery segment. And he goes over the fact that she um, had the breakdown on the set. But um, as of why I – how does she know him, I'm not sure. I just know that he ends up being a, a friend, and he's a shady character, and, and Linda Curtis was a shady character, and I guess shady characters stand out with one another. So, Okay. Is it possible that the, the, the multiple Social Security numbers – just going to throw this idea out there – that it does seem that Tammy was getting some work – that might have been should have maybe given to older women you know she's under 18 she might have been even under 18 when she did the the filming for scarface uh if uh, people look into her resume her entertainment resume she did some modeling that once again might be reserved for 19 20 year olds could it be that she was like faking her age being that her mother was somewhat of a con artist could it have been that you know, she was passing off Tammy as being 20, 21 when she was really only 16, 17. It's possible. But, yeah, I mean, I mean I'm not going to count anything out, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, but I think Tammy looked older than she was naturally, so I don't really think that you may not have had to fake it. Like, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, she filmed a, a, a movie. It was like a little chick flick or something called Little Darlings, and it had Tatum O'Neill and another lady in it. I forget, which are pretty – they're, they're, I think they were models at the time. I know who Tatum O'Neill is, but I forget the other girl's name. You can look it up. But apparently, um, she only had a, a cameo in it. I don't even think she had a line in the movie. But her presence, she, she's a very beautiful lady, of course. Her presence on the set caused the other two to get jealous because the Paramount people were actually looking at Tammy more than they were looking at the two stars of the movie. So much so that Tatum O'Neill had people usher her off the actual lot while a national uh, magazine came in and did interviews for that movie. Um, I don't uh, – I think Tammy turned heads naturally. I don't think she had to fake anything, to be honest okay. with you. She could um, – She could, well, I mean, uh, Tatum O'Neill was a pretty good actress at the time, and, and mm -hmm. she was pretty jealous. Sure. I'm just maybe wondering just for paperwork reasons. Yeah, I suppose it's possible. Yeah, and I don't think anything's impossible. Yeah, Linda. maybe – Get a fake – maybe the lawyer could have helped them get a fake Social Security number that they would look up and say, oh, yeah, this girl, she's not 17. She's actually 21, you know, mm -hmm. so she oh, can absolutely. do more work or – it's possible. It still happens to this well, day. A, you know, maybe it's her today in the thing. digital age. Yeah. And digital age, it still happens today. And if you think about how much easier it would be back then, you know, it wouldn't be too right. hard. Right. So maybe that is – maybe there is something to it that maybe she had multiple Social Security numbers. And if her mother was – Little shady, little you know, wants to get people into um, roles or acting or modeling gigs that they're too young for. 
maybe some paperwork did get forged once in a while. I, I can, being that I have an entertainment background. I can background, definitely see that. Yeah. You know, being that I have an entertainment background, I, I could see that happening. Where does this case stay? Is this what you would call, in your experience as a true crime crime blogger, is this a cold case? Yeah, I, def- I think it definitely is a cold case. Absolutely. Yeah. At this point, as you stated earlier with Keith Roberts, uh, we're recording this on August 13th, 2017. Uh, is he in jail right now? Uh, he was as of like three or four days ago. I don't know if he is now. I imagine he probably would have seen the judge by now and he may be out on bond. But as of like three to four days ago, he was still in jail. Do you, In speaking to Suzanne and or Debbie, do they know if ever since 1983 have the police ever – followed up for him with him in, in any form just to see you know kind of check back in with him i know that back then that maybe detective lewis thought yeah it's possible that she ran off but to your knowledge the police have never questioned or tried to question keith roberts ever again since the 1980s not to my knowledge he's never been questioned regarding the case at all one thing debbie did tell me um years ago and she couldn't put a date on it but the they did come to acquire some DNA from her. I imagine to put it in uh, the CODIS data bank, maybe, for mm-hmm. comparative analysis. But they did obtain DNA from Debbie, and I imagine they want to compare that to maybe, you know, unknown victims that maybe on some tables right now they're trying to identify. So, okay. Do you, in your experience, you have a lot of experience reading disappearance cases like I do, Anthony. Is this something where you think that Keith Roberts is probably – do you believe that something wrong or criminal did happen to Tammy? And if so, do you think that Keith Roberts is the best possibility in this? In my estimation, something did happen to Tammy Leppard. I, I do not believe her to be alive today, and I believe it happened shortly after um, Roberts picked her up. Roberts um, is a very good suspect, if not – The people that he hung around with should be questioned, and that's one thing I brought up when I spoke to Terry. I was hoping she would be able to tell me. They got married a couple years after all this happened, and she didn't know about it two years afterwards. But Mm. um, I wanted to know if I could, if she had any names of any associates of of him, and she she couldn't think of any um, right offhand. But uh, Roberts knows what happened. I'm almost convinced of it. I'd love to talk to him myself, but. but, yeah, Keith Roberts is definitely somebody that needs to be talked to and questioned. And he's never, like I said, Scraggs even said that he's never been properly interrogated. So, yeah. Is this – do you feel in this case, is this one of those situations where even if we were to question Keith Roberts and he just sat there and said, nope, I had nothing to do with it, unfortunately there's really no – way to prove him wrong is there i mean it's been so many years it's been 34 years we don't have a, we have no real nothing to go on is that how you feel about this yes and no um i believe there's been other cases and uh, forgive me i can't think of it right offhand there's been other cases where the police have law enforcement have provided adequate pressure to get something out of people whether they have pending charges or whatnot um, to be honest with you, um, I think when they booked him um, recently this month, I don't think they even knew anything about the Tammy Leopard case, even if they looked at his record. I don't know if it's even in there. Um, according to Terry, his ex-wife, he tended to get out of a lot of things. His uh, his mother uh, was actually at one point a 911 operator, and, and she was really familiar with a lot of cops in the area. Again, I'm not, dis- I'm not trying to um, cast aspersions on her character. Um, from what I understand and what I've read, she's actually a very, um, a very nice lady. So, like I guess I don't want to cast aspersions on his family. He could just be a bad apple. He's definitely a bad apple. But and we should say for uh, the record that Keith Roberts has been married and divorced many times, many times since from what since I wife number one before Tammy, since wife number two Terry Lynn, and wife number three and wife number four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've been able to locate and track down two of his exes, but from mm-hmm. a, what I've heard, Terry told me she's been married more than that. So I was able to send an email to the one that he married in 79. I've not received a, a response. So, but yeah, he's been married many times. And um, I, I, I threw the question at Terry 
I asked her how likely would it be would she think that Tammy may have been pregnant by Keith and she thinks it's a high possibility? And I asked her the possibility of Keith Roberts either doing something or being involved with Tammy's disappearance and she absolutely thinks that he did. Where can the listeners find you, Anthony? You, um, you run the crime blogger, 1983.blogspot.com, but um, tell them a little bit about that site and tell them anywhere else uh, that they can find you in social media, online, internet. Um, basically, the, the, the blog, the one you mentioned, and my email is crimeblogger1983 at gmail.com. Um, Every I get a couple case cases uh, suggestions from family members or friends every every couple months, and I'll try to I'll try to do them. Sometimes I don't, depending upon the case information that I have online and stuff like that. Um, but I'm willing to if they want some kind of attention brought to a case, I'll definitely help them out. I've helped a couple of the cases. Uh, Joshua Wayne Crawford, uh, his, her, his mom reached out to me. He was murdered in uh, Frederick, Maryland, in 2003. And we recently, um, I'd like to think I helped anyway, I'm not sure. But the police have reopened that one and then taken another look at it. So um, I've helped a, a couple of families like that. At least I hope to hope I had mm -hmm. something to do with it. But um, yeah, my email and my blog are pretty much it. I don't really have a social media presence. Okay. Not on, not on Twitter. Maybe you'll think about that one of these days or uh, no Facebook page. I know you are on Facebook, but... Uh, we're going to keep your per personal uh, page off here. I know you like to, your your anonymity uh, for the most part regarding all of this. Uh, I totally respect that. Any last words before we finish up this interview and, and concerning the disappearance of Tammy Leppard? No, I, the only thing I hope that comes out of this is people get more interested in that case and get her, her case. You know, if they have friends that do blogs like I do or any, anybody else, just try to get that case. That's... It was a case – one of the reasons I started that blog was for her. She wasn't my first case. It ended up being Mary Boyle because I ended up watching a documentary that night before and, and I did a case on her. That's a good one too. So if you want to look into that, that's Ireland's oldest cold case, um, missing person or cold case, child's cold case, whatever you want to call it. But no, if you just get the message out there. I think I think this case lacks – a lot of connection with Keith Roberts. There's not a whole lot of mention of him. There's a mention of mm -hmm. Keith and, and so on, but people don't know who he really is. And um, I want, I'd want i like to get that out there. I know Debbie and Suzanne have done a lot of work, a, a lot more work than I have. I've, I've tried to take all the information and put it together on, on my blog entry, but those two have really done the year's work. Uh, and we'd like to get, you know, her name to, to remain in the public eye and get some, kind of recognition but that's one thing like i said tammy's case didn't uh, have a lot of media attention it was just local and that's another thing that really kind of i don't understand it you know she was involved in movies and so on i thought she would at least get some kind of national attention the only national attention she got was that unsolved mystery segment i never understood it so okay just try to get the message out and try to get something going i have a feeling like i said she may be deceased and i have a feeling She's probably in that Lakeland area somewhere, but that's just a feeling. I don't have anything to back that up, just trying to connect the dots over the, the years of investigating the case, but I, I would have a feeling that she's somewhere in the Lakeland area. Okay. Maybe you and I can work with Suzanne and Debbie to let the uh, police know uh, wherever Keith Roberts is in custody now that they have at least a witness to the disappearance of a woman from 1983, like you said, I'm I'm sure they don't even realize that at this point. And yeah, maybe we could work, that, we yeah. could we could work together uh, to let them know that this guy just isn't any guy. This is possibly a guy who might know something about disappearance and be able to close a cold case that's 34 years old. Maybe we can work together yeah. to do that. Absolutely, I'd love that. Uh, you, like I said, you're the best at what you do in terms of the podcasting, and I, and I really mean that. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on and discuss the case. Anthony, uh, thank you for the kind words again. Deeply appreciated, and I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much, Ed. You have a, a great night, right? You too. Thank you. And that was my interview with Anthony Wayne writer and owner of the blog, crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. 
I thank him for being on this episode. I also want to thank the sisters of Tammy, Suzanne and Debbie, who have communicated with Anthony and have helped him get the word out about their sister's case. I ask all the listeners to continue to check out Anthony's blog because I know he's going to continue to work very hard to solve the disappearance of Tammy Leppert. And he's also blogged about some other cases that I think you should check out. So please go to his blog for those updates and posts. I started this episode talking about diversions. Those websites, hobbies, daydreams that can take us away from what we need to do on a daily basis. Not such a big deal for the average person, although it does kill productivity. For law enforcement and all of those people who desire to solve these cases, getting diverted has worse consequences, culminating in Tammy's case that is still unsolved after 34 years and then has no movement on it in virtually that entire span. Because that's the way I feel after listening to what Anthony told me and all of you. The police. It seems like they wanted to put Tammy's case off their plate as soon as possible. So Detective Lewis believed an anonymous phone call about Tammy becoming a nurse. What kind of serious investigator does that? I get the feeling he was looking for anything to divert his attention away from Tammy's case. And that phone call was exactly what the doctor ordered. That kind of attitude continues with police departments to this day regarding missing persons cases. Linda Curtis, Tammy's mother. Due to her own flaws and temptations, she muddied the waters and diverted the public's attention to Christopher Wilder when she sued his estate for a million dollars. She also came up with a theory that Tammy found out about some conspiracy involving drugs and money without offering any proof, thus creating another diversion. Tammy herself, and I am no way trying to blame the victim here, but her inability to explain to anyone, including Rick Adams, the reason for her paranoia has probably caused many people to not take this case seriously, due to many people believing she lost her mind and ran off. I think the mystery of Tammy's issues has even served to allow people to think she faked it all in an effort to sneak away. Once again, another diversion that has no proof to support it. And in this host's humble opinion, all these diversions have only served to do one thing. They have allowed Keith Roberts to evade serious police questioning for 34 years. Hey, the police are so diverted that they still insist he had nothing to do with Tammy's disappearance. How would they know that if Keith has declined to meet with them over the last 34 years? I guess the police have better things to do. They're too diverted to solve a 34-year-old case. Well, the police don't have any excuses now. Keith is in their custody as of August 18th, 2017. And it's time for them to divert their attention back to Mr. Roberts. And in fact, I'd start with this. I'd track down any of his former girlfriends and wives to see if Keith ever asked one of them to make a call to police in about 1985 to tell them that Tammy ran off to be a nurse. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.